Hi folks, Matt Easton here. So I'm here with Tobias Catlock of the Wallace Collection. We are in the Wallace Collection. Um, and what we're specifically looking at here are pole axes. We have two rather well-known pole axes. And um, there aren't a huge number of surviving pole axes in the world, are there really? No, there, there are more in sort of museum reserve collections than one might think. And now that a lot more people are getting interested in this sort of thing, the, the lesser known ones are getting more attention. But there's a couple, there's like four or five famous ones, and then there are probably about 20 or 30 good ones that not many people know about that are becoming increasingly famous. But yeah, it's a small group. Yeah. So first up, we should say, what is a pole axe? Well, a pole axe essentially is an, an uh, what I would describe anyway. Toby, pick me up if you, if you disagree with anything I say. But um, I would say it's an armoured man's fighting pole weapon, essentially. So it combines features of sometimes a war hammer or an axe um, with essentially a spear. Um, so what we've got are various forms of axe and hammer combinations at the top. Um, and uh, a spear point essentially at the top, which is somewhat similar to this weapon called an ar archbice, yeah. uh, which is a similar kind of idea to that. So it's an armor piercing point on the top of the weapon. Um, and these are points that are really designed to do a lot of, a huge amount of internal damage on a person, not like a traditional spearhead, but they are very good for penetration. Would you agree with that? I mean, they're, they're a bit like a rumble dagger blade. Yeah, so. they, they have a lot of different kinds of protective materials that they need to get through or injure in some way through the have effectiveness against. So they have to be big and strong section and get in there somehow to do something. Yeah, so um, we've got two pole axes here. One, uh, in fact they both have axe blades and they both have hammers on the rear with a spike at the top. Um, I would say that this is a later than that one. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So what we're looking at, if we look at the one, this is quite famous, this has been in many books. There is um, at least one similar example I can think of from the Royal Armouries mm -hmm. in Leeds, mm -hmm. um, which is a similar sort of format. Um, and it has, I'll do close-ups of the uh, Pollack's top heads in a minute so you can see them more clearly. Um, but it essentially has a straight bladed axe on one side a hammer that someone sometimes gets uh, compared to or likened to a meat tenderizer on the back side, so we'll look at that uh, close up in a second, with a square section spike at the top. And if I understand correctly, the construction of these axe heads uh, is not like a conventional polearm head, but uh, you actually have a, essentially one piece of metal in the middle, don't you, that, that the langets kind of sit yeah. over. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing is built around a kind of base. And then it, it, it all clicks together and, and um, is riveted or nailed down at the sides. And yeah. If the langets, uh, you know, guard against the top of the weapon being chopped away, sometimes they're only on two sides. Sometimes they're on four sides. Sometimes basically the whole top of the of the staff is sheathed in, in metal, like like that. Yeah. So this so this one, the uh, langets, so the the sheathing parts of steel are um, come around the shaft at the top to protect the shaft, uh, and I've spoken about this in previous videos, partly probably to protect the shaft from other people's weapons, but partly also probably to protect from breaking, mm -hmm. uh, because very often if you're hitting things very hard with a, a mace or a hammer, the place it will break is just underneath the head, so it's probably making the whole assembly stronger as well. Um, but this one, which is probably earlier here, and again I'll show you a close-up on this in a minute, um, is completely sheathed right the way down to that point. Uh, and then below that it just has, oh no, it does have, the langets continue on four sides, but they're not joined up anymore. So it's like a full iron sheet here and then four langets going quite a long way down, in fact, pretty much halfway down the weapon. Um, is that quite a heavy weapon? Not really, no? not really. I mean, with these, with these long staff weapons, you know, the perception of weight can, can be manipulated. And then if the, sometimes the staffs flare out towards the cube, so there's a fair amount of counterbalancing going on, even if you don't have a big lump of metal at the other end. Mm. And it does, I mean, the head is quite small. It doesn't feel, it doesn't, there's not much of a perception of, of serious weight, but, but they, still, they still pack a punch. Yeah.
Many people will be used to seeing things like poleaxes from books or even in artwork, um, be it historical or fancy or anything else. And as you'll see, actually, the, there's my hand. The poleaxe head isn't particularly big. Um, and obviously, it's in the cabinet, so it's a bit further back from you uh, than my hand is. But it's, we're already talking, what, probably about six or seven inches mm -hmm. from the front of the axe to the back of the hammer. It's not a particularly big thing but it's big enough to do the job that it's intended for, and that's striking with a lot of leverage, a lot of force, into preferably vulnerable parts of a person's armour, or maybe their helmet to disorientate them, or, or whatever. And of course these are used for leverage, not just for striking. You're not just hitting with that end. And of course the bottom end is very important as well. The, this one here, I can't show you at the moment, but this one has an iron fitting on the bottom. Do we know if that's original to this? or? It's hard to say. Yeah. One tends to say probably not, just to be safe. Yeah. Um, I, the the cues in you know, illustrated in, in contemporary images mm -hmm. seem more often to have some kind of spike or yeah. something useful, and this just has a kind of spherical terminal at the end, which it's not impossible, but you know, just one has to be a little bit cautious. Yeah. Very often, the only original part of these things is the head. And then they've been re-staffed in the in the 19th century or something. Often, a lot of the shorter uh, so-called horseman's hammers or war hammers that you get in museums, including this one, some of them you wonder whether they might originally have been two-handed weapons that have been reinterpreted or restored in a different form at a different day. Yeah. Um, but um, in fact, we do have a we have a war hammer over here, which is a, uh, set up as a one-handed weapon, yeah. which. It wouldn't surprise me, I'll show you that in a minute, but it wouldn't surprise me if that originally was on a pole length. Um, I'd be um, very surprised if it wasn't originally yeah, on, a, on yeah. something that was sort of shoulder yeah. height at least. Yeah. Uh, conversely, maces incidentally are usually really short, mm -hmm. often shorter than people, uh, people realise. I'll, again, I'll show um, maces in a future video. Um, so, essentially with a pole axe we've got a relatively complex construction to the head unlike halberds for the most part, we'll talk about halberds in a minute, um, and you've pretty much always got langettes protecting the, at least the upper half of the weapon. And then, as Toby said, often you've got a broader base to the shaft to help balance it, and very often some type of pointy shoe um, or spike on the bottom end. So you've got your ability to thrust with the top, the bottom, and hit with both sides of the staff. And of course, sometimes they have uh, hand guards like this one does here, just by my finger. Um, those hand guards, I think, have probably got two functions, partly to protect the hand, obviously, but I think possibly also to assist with force of thrusting as well, like a rondel dagger. So a rondel dagger doesn't have rondels to protect the hand, probably. It's probably there to so that you can give them more force in the, in the stab. And I think it's probably the same case with these and other pole weapons that were around in the 15th century. Um, incidentally, Toby, what do you think the dates are of these two approximately? Mm -hmm. I, I have the sense that this is mid or second half of the 15th century. Right. It just has a later sort of yeah. gothic -y look. The lines a bit. Um, and, yeah. it, it could very well be French. Um, it's very hard to say for certain. Um, the heads in their typology uh, vary quite a lot, mm -hmm. um, but I've noticed, and it's just a generalization and not an absolute rule, but a number of the surviving Paul axes that have old English provenances, uh, where they seem to have been in England at the time of their use, or at least for quite a long time, mm -hmm. they tend to have an axe blade combined with a long curved fluke rather than a hammerhead type of thing. And, so and more of a spike. Yeah, it's, it's like the long beaky, yeah. beaky sort of big striking flute, right. a fluke. Um, so that, with the, with the meat tenderizer and the axe blade, just looks a little bit more continental, but there's no reason why that couldn't also have been in use in England. Um, but there's a, and some of course you get this, the, the big curved beak mm. with a hammerhead and no blade at all, and mm. they're still called Paul axes, yeah. or back to Falcon Falcon's beak. It's kind of descriptive. And that's an old term. Um, so that, but that seems generally more like the, the sort of Wars of the Roses period. Whereas this one, on balance, it has a simpler construction, uh, a, a plainer kind of aesthetic. 
Um, and if that's su suggestive of an earlier date. Yeah. This one's more likely to be earlier 15th century um, Agincourt period than, than that one certainly is. But it's real hard to be sure because these are really well designed weapons for fighting, you know, for, for men in armor to fight other men in armor. And they're robust weapons that have a good chance of doing some damage uh, to an armored man. And, and a well designed thing like this in a fighting functional context that doesn't change that much over a hundred year period. Um, they're doing the they, same They're job. doing the same job, yeah. so they're still good weapons. And yeah. they continue to be used. And I, I think one of the real defining characteristics of, of the pole axes, you look at all the surviving pole axes, uh, P-O-L-L, -L, you know, head axe, as opposed to pole weapon or staff weapon. Um, these knightly, aristocratic weapons of the armored men fighting other armored men, they tend to, more often than not to be decorated, to have a, a decorative quality. And um, you know, this one's inlaid with yellow metal. The, the, the meat tenderizer hammer, hammer head has um, uh, uh, a bon coeur inscribed on it with good heart. Uh, and the, the cur is actually an image of a Valentine type heart. <laughs> so it's sort of like, with love, yeah. I'm going to cave your head in. Um, so there's, there's that, that love of medieval decoration and the beauty even on things that seem to have kind of a, a scary function. Um, and, and that's what, what really, that, that decorative quality even on a practical fighting weapon is something that really uh, defines them as knightly weapons. Um, but that, that one does come off as looking a bit earlier. I, I, I've sort of been wondering about whether this might be speci a specialized example for tournament fighting. Uh, the blade never seems to have been sharp. It doesn't have very much of a distant taper. The spike never seems to have been especially sharp. And it's got this coronel-like head on the back, which you know, you could interpret as an anti-penetration safety device. So a coronel uh, coming from the word crown right. is what was used on the point of lances in jousts yeah. to prevent penetration, essentially. Specifically, jousts of peace. Yeah. If, you know, a, a, a jouster looks at this axe, that looks like it's an, it's an armed courtois, a weapon of courtesy, a weapon of peace, which you can fight with robustly and have confidence that you won't, you know, cause serious damage to your opponent. On the other hand, for anybody who's wearing anything less than full plate armor, that could still do some serious damage, and you do see them illustrated in battle scenes, so you never can be sure about any of this. Yeah. And so I think the uh, final thing to say on pole axes for the time being is that these are, just to reiterate, these are high status weapons that are usually carried by so-called knights or men at arms. And there are highly armor. developed, codified yeah. martial arts systems yeah developed specifically for them. Very much and not so. to say the common soldiers using, you know, staff weapons like the halberd wouldn't know how to use them, but the, the martial arts system is probably simpler, more practical, not as systematized, not as codified, in quite the same way, at least not until the 16th century when there's a renewed interest in, yeah. in lower class weapons as well, even among the nobility. And I think, yeah, I think that's fair to say, and if you uh, look at the Bolognese sources of the 16th century, the uh, Polax of uh, Anonimo Bolognese is very much more complex, there's a lot more techniques to it than if you look at the Ronca, for example, the Bill uh, in uh, Manchelino and Morosso. It seems like it's a more complex system. And the other thing worth mentioning as well is pole axes are, relatively speaking, short. They're about mm -hmm. man height, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Which suits fighting in armour because your armour is, you don't need the length advantage, you actually want to get in close with someone if you've got the armour. And sometimes they're they're comparatively speaking pretty short. Mm. I mean, sometimes in the illustrations of the, you know, in, in art, they seem to only be about yeah. sort of chest, sternum height. You see them sort of leaning, leaning yeah. on them with their, yeah. with their arm uh, draped over the top. So and yeah. sometimes the rondel, there's a rondel right at the back end. Yeah. So you expect them that they're almost choked up on these yeah. things as far as they can go. And I certainly, if you think about in a war context, uh, if you're using a poleaxe in the press of a battle, like a dashing core, for example, you don't want a weapon that's very long if you're an armoured man at arms in that context. You want, you know, whether you're half sorting with a sword or using a rondel dagger or a poleaxe, you want something you can use in the press. Um, you're not forming blocks of like pikemen or halberdiers or these type of polar users. So it's a very different beast to the halberd. So 
often people ask what's the difference between a pole axe and a halberd. We're going to look at halberd in a second, um, but one of the main things is that it's shorter, it's very high status, it's got complex construction, and it's really suited to fighting in armour. It's the armoured man's halberd, essentially, the armoured man's pole arm. And very much associated too with this cult of individual personal prowess. Not to say that knights and men arms didn't work in teams, of course they did, but the weapon isn't designed so much specifically for working as part of a team in the way a halberd might be. So it's that cult of individual heroic personality versus the regimented, more modern image of, of soldiers deployed on the battlefield. Yeah. Great, okay, thank you, Toby. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.